beginning of the 20th century was a tough time for the Russian Empire. They'd killed off their royal family with its economy at the lowest point that it had been in her history. That coupled with one civil war rolling into the next, culminating with the country's disastrous entrance into World War I, with millions of lives lost in battle and just as many perishing from famine. And with its borders covering over 23 million kilometers, even the government didn't have a clue about what the population was and who was doing what, when and where. But it was around this time that this government put together a crack team to study meteorites. And this team was headed by Leonard Kulik. One day while doing his research, Kulik stumbled across an old newspaper article about a firestorm in the sky that obliterated an entire forest melting anything in its path, including farmers, livestock, and trees. And the fact that it had happened 12 years earlier in Tunguska, Siberia, one of the most desolate parts of the world, a wooded marsh area that many believed was inhabited by savages, meaning there was a high possibility that the event may not have happened and it was just some sort of tribal bogeyman. It was after two failed attempts in a seven year span to reach this desolate location that Kulik would find his answer. In this world, there are things that go beyond our understanding. Things that our tiny minds cannot possibly comprehend. Like where does reality end and dreams begin? between the flick of a light switch and a dream. We continually shroud ourselves in a veil of illusion. In his first two attempts to reach Tunguska, he was held back by disease and severe weather conditions. The Tunguska River is now near modern-day Krasnias and is still considered one of the most remote parts of the world. Disease-ridden swamps, severe weather changes, but Kulik had more than just the terrain to worry about. The locals were still savages and believed in a variety of pagan gods. But when he reached the Tunguska River, he was shocked what he saw. The trees, as far as he could see, were laying down straight like arrows with a blast that seemed to have come from above with no point of impact or crater. His guides had now abandoned him for fear of the god's revenge. But Kula continued trying to find the epicenter of the blast. The natives who did speak to him said that they saw a flat flying rock that resembled a city. Once Kulik reached the center of the blast, he was even more shocked for what he found with trees standing up like telephone poles. A point of impact, but without a crater? It seemed to defy everything he knew. Now running out of food, he had to return to Moscow. With bad news telling his superiors he didn't have a fucking clue what had happened. And the worst part is he was trying to convince his bosses it was a media, and he couldn't even show him a stone that he'd found. The media love an egghead returned two more times in his life to the location, and still he left knowing less than when he arrived. And now, over a hundred years later, the area, known as the Dead Forest, still shows signs of that eventful day. And meteorites have never been uncommon to Russia, but they all have one similarity, a point of impact. Scientists now believe that the explosion was a thousand times more intense than Hiroshima. And the Russian government now admit, because back then they didn't have an adequate census system, They'll never know how many lives may have been lost. But not all things that we perceive are out to destroy us can be blamed on outer space. And not every mystery takes a genius to get to the bottom of. These are tumultuous, reckless, and uncertain times. But did you ever consider that in contrast to the popular beliefs that are shouted down at us, we are not evolving, we are mutating. Goddamn freaks of nature. Cash and point. In our short history, that the Homo sapien has existed on this earth, we have ravaged this planet. From the depths of the jungle to the highest mountain tops. And we're not just leaving a footprint. We've been pushing our whole leg up our god's ass. 
And there's not a better example of this than in our oceans, with years of waste being dumped and building up. And now, here's a surprise. It's causing us an imminent threat. Experts are unsure when the Great Pacific Garbage Patch appeared, but we now know it exists. Literally a floating island of trash, made up of plastic packaging, bottles, abandoned fishing nets, wood, and general waste that has all converged from the lakes and the waterways of this world, brought together by the currents, and then congregating like flies on a dying kitty cat. With the debris now permanently trapped by these very currents, a vortex of the damned. The largest of these floating islands that scientists call patches is three times the size of Texas. With the most threatening of these being in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Japan. And scientists believe that these patches cause an imminent threat not only to nature, but to mankind. Because although plastic does eventually break down, it breaks down into microplastic. With many of the sea life in the area feeding on it, with up to 74% of their diet being the plastics that eventually ends up on our dinner table. Bon appetit, sweetheart. And scientists figure it might be a reason why men have a decline in sperm count. That's why I only eat meat and I got huge balls. So if you ever wonder why so many pussies get offended these days, it's because they're taking that plastic more than just up their ass. So it seems in regards to the extinction of the human race, it's only a matter of time. Please remember to like my video and smash that thumbs up button. Cause like I give a flying fuck. Also fine because if a child is sacrificed, that child's body isn't going to be left. If it's an orthodox satanic cult, they're going to burn the body and they're going to, to eat it during ceremony. So there'll leave no evidence around. In this life, we are caught between what we know to be true and what we hope to be true. And sadly, there are no variances on this. And even then, most of us end up wrong. So you better wise up, suckers. Case in point. Jeanette the Palmer enjoyed preaching the word of the Lord. In fact, she figured it were her lot in life. You couldn't finish your pop top without Jeanette slipping the big man's name into a conversation. But the part of Jersey that she hailed from had a reputation for not being so hospitable to the godly one. You and intense scrutiny on the activities of satanic cults. Stories of devil worship and satanic cults corrupting young minds. Unbelievable crime at the hands of satanic cults. It was on July 7th that Jeanette said goodbye to her mother and set out by train to visit her friend. When she missed her curfew and never returned home that night, her mother called the police. At first, the cops told the mother not to panic and that it was more than likely that the pretty teen had run away or found herself a boyfriend. But that was the furthest thing from reality because it was six weeks later that a dog returned to his home to give his owner a gift, a rotted, maggot-eaten arm with red nail polish on its young fingertips. And when New Jersey's finest started poking around, it didn't take them long to figure out who the arm belonged to. And they were horrified what they found, because lying naked, face down in the dirt, looking like a goddamn religious icon, was Jeanette De Palma, her body surrounded by religious iconography and logs in the shape of a coffin. Too decomposed for cops to figure out how she died, her last resting place on the edge of a cliff known as the Devil's Teeth, a spot rumored to be frequented by Satanists to perform their rituals. And now the resting place for a girl barely 16. And although the police pleaded for witnesses, the town fell silent. And to this day, no one knows what happened to the good, God-fearing girl. This world, or realm, if you will, that we exist in, 
is only real as long as we exist. Once we cease to exist, <laughs> well then it's not real. Case in point. Meet Captain Briggs and his adorable family. The Mary Celeste was an American merchant ship that had just left New York Harbor. Bound for the sunny shores of Italy, or Wapland as I like to call her. Benjamin Briggs, a seasoned captain, had just bought the ship to go into business for himself, where he would be transporting 1,701 barrels of methylated spirits to Italy. I guess the one extra barrel was a gift for his father-in-law. The methylated spirits was used to fuel cooking stoves and other similar devices, and in accordance with laws to avoid heavy taxation placed on drinking alcohol, the fuel was mixed with several poisons to make it undrinkable. Nevertheless, this didn't stop some, and those who drank the fuel would go blind, mad, and often died. On this journey, Briggs would be accompanied by his wife and infant daughter, leaving his son at home with his grandmother as he was still attending school. The Mary Celeste began her faithful voyage November 7th, 1872. Sailing with seven crewmen, Captain Benjamin Spooner Briggs, his wife Sarah, and the couple's two-year-old daughter Sophia. The 282-ton brigantine battled heavy weather for two weeks before reaching islands off of Portugal, where the ship's log's last entry was recorded at 5 a.m. on November 25th. In the captain's log, nothing appeared to be out of the ordinary. The captain complained about the rough seas and said his daughter had been suffering from seasickness, but otherwise it was a standard entry that didn't raise any suspicions. Ten days later, and less than a month after the ship had left New York Harbor, the Mary Celeste was spotted full sail by a Canadian vessel, De Gratia, 400 miles east of the Azores, a set of desolate islands in the mid-Atlantic belonging to Portugal. Seeing that one of the Mary Celeste's sails had been damaged and no one on deck, the De Gratia's captain hailed out to the ship. When they got no response, they boarded her. Once on board, the crew of the De Gratia found themselves on a goddamn ghost ship. With its cargo intact, six months worth of food and supplies, including goats and chickens, and whoever left, well, they did it in a hurry, because they didn't even bring their personal possessions with them. And the captain had left his logbook, something that an experienced captain wouldn't do, something that Benjamin Briggs wouldn't do. This baffled but at the same time frightened the crew members who had boarded the Mary Celeste. As they further explored the ship, they noticed that one of the water pumps had purposefully been disabled or was broken, and the ship had taken on three feet worth of water. When they checked the Mary Celeste's cargo list, it was all there. 1,701 barrels of methylated spirit. Upon closer inspection, though, three of the barrels were empty. These barrels had been made of oak and not cedar like the rest of them, so it's not impossible that they had leaked and there was no sign of a fire. And if there were fumes, it wasn't enough to kill the livestock, so it certainly wouldn't have killed any of the crew. So what happened on board the Mary Celeste? Now the De Gratia, according to maritime law, was able to claim salvage rights and a reward on the value of the ship and all its cargo, and proceeded to tow the vessel to the nearest port in Gibraltar. And to this day, the ghost ship, known as the Mary Celeste, is one of the Maritime's biggest mysteries. Over the years, there have been several theories by experts. One is that the crew members had been drinking the highly poisonous cargo, and in a state of madness, when confronted by the captain, murdered him and his family, throwing them overboard, then taking a lifeboat to the nearby islands that they could see on the horizon. It was reported that a ripped dress had been found, but also on the captain's door there were marks that resembled an axe and signs of blood, but this theory was never proven. Another theory was a natural disaster and the possibility that the ship had fell foul of a water spout, basically a tornado at sea, which had caused the Celeste to take on water, and because of the broken pump and cargo concealing the lower decks, the captain ordered the ship to be abandoned, believing it was sinking. But if this was the case, 
Why didn't he bring any supplies? And most importantly, why didn't he bring the logbook? Essential if he needed to claim back the money for insurance. And no reputable captain would climb onto a lifeboat when his ship is still afloat. And now the third, and what many experts believe to be the most plausible of theories. An alcohol explosion. The cargo that the ship was carrying was industrial strength alcohol. And if the crew didn't drink the three empty barrels, what happened to it? In the Mary Celeste location, there have been documented severe storms, and due to the porous barrels, noxious alcohol may have escaped, causing a small explosion, leaving the captain to believe that a larger explosion was imminent, but also leaving the possibility that Briggs gave the order for the crew to temporarily abandon ship, loading everyone onto the small lifeboat and attaching it to the ship at a safe distance until the danger passed. But with rough seas and possible waves up to 100 feet tall, it's not impossible that the rope could have come undone. Damning the captain, his family, and his crew to the unforgiving immensity of the sea. This is Debug. If you enjoy what I do, think of signing up to Patreon. And whereas for as low as a buck, you get exclusive content, early releases, a weekly podcast, and much more. YouTube is now shadow banning me and forced me to remove a lot of my content. If you want to see that content, you can go over to Odyssey. Your invite is in the description. Remember, I do this all by myself. I got no team. Just me, myself, and I.